Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another Humankind Emblematic District tier guide video as we're covering the early modern era today. If you missed out any of our previous eras from ancient to medieval, feel free to use the link in the description below to find the playlist of all our tier list video for Humankind. Now, much like those tier lists from before, we'll be kicking things off with an overview of each of these 10 emblematic district to cover their strengths and weaknesses before coming back here to give them a proper ranking. So kicking things off, we have the Barbican. So the Barbican belongs to the Poles and it exploits nothing because it essentially functions as a premium garrison building. And we say it's premium because you gain two extra points of influence, 20 extra district fortification, plus three combat strength for units in and adjacent to it, as well as eight stability. All these stats are better than a standard garrison. So in essence, it's not a bad building, because of all these upgrades, but it is pretty much a garrison building. Then we have the Bottega di Artisti from the Venetians, and it's a market quarter that exploits nothing. Now this might sound bad, but in reality, it functions exactly like a normal market quarter because there's no native money tiles in the game. So exploiting nothing here doesn't ruin anything. Any sort of money you can gain on luxuries are already exploited by their artisan quarters. So you're not actually going to be missing out on anything by building this next to them. You'll gain plus four influence plus one money by default and additional plus one influence per adjacent money quarter and plus one money on tiles producing money. This is the strongest attribute of this emblematic district because this can scale amazingly depending on how many territories you own and it can be used in the late game when you start absorbing cities together to get more of this bonus on more tiles, since the bigger your city, the more tiles you have producing money, and the more of your emblematic district you can fit in a city to basically produce a lot of extra money on all your tiles already producing money. And as a standard for most emblematic districts, you'll be losing 10 points stability. The only blatant weakness here is the lack of a trader slot, which means one less job, putting a bit of strain on your food supplies, then moving on for the Spanish, we have the Cathedral Gothic, uh, basically Gothic Cathedral here. It is a faith building, so it actually exploits nothing. It doesn't count as any basic quarters. You get plus one faith per population and plus three faith per adjacent district. You will also lose 10 points stability. This makes this Imad district quite weak. And in my opinion, if you're in the early modern era and you're still trying to catch up on faith, you're already losing the game. And it's really hard to come back once your population have already been converted to another faith. Essentially, you have to pretty much fight your way out of that situation by launching armies into enemy territories to wipe out their religious pressure to kind of restore your faith in your population. Simply adding a bit of faith here per population isn't really going to save you. So I feel like this building essentially cannot save you when you are super behind on faith and also doesn't add much value when you're ahead because in the game of humankind, you want fame and getting a huge religious advantage through faith doesn't actually give you much fame, perhaps only a deed. And then moving on to the Ming, we have the Grand Tea House. This also exploits nothing and it functions as an influence building that provides plus one influence on all your existing district and plus two influence per adjacent district, as well as plus 10 points stability, like many of the Chinese theme emblematic districts. So this one's actually quite interesting. On paper, we have another exploit nothing, counts as nothing quarter, but you can actually gain quite a bit of influence and influence is immensely more useful than faith in my opinion, because you can use it to combine cities, expand land, add new territories to existing cities, pick up late game civics, which does snowball to quite a heavy cost. So there are a lot more uses for influence than faith per se and this can generate a ton of influence. Much like the Venetian building that provide plus one money on tiles producing money, this plus one influence per district, it's gonna be per copy of your grand tea house inside your city. So essentially you can add up quite a bit of bonus, especially if you use a lot of garrison buildings. The grand tea house is designed to fit in in the middle of a bunch of garrison buildings on your frontier, because it does not impact your yield on adjacent district by building it that way you gain a huge amount of stability, not only from your garrison, but also the Grand Tea House, and you can get your maximum 12 points of influence on your Grand Tea House by surrounding it with six garrisons. 
that's typically the most efficient way of building Grand Tea House, in my opinion. You also get an extra point of influence on all your garrison per Grand Tea House, so essentially per territory you have. So it's a very interesting usage of the Grand Tea House, and I think it's decently powerful. Then moving on for the Mughals, we have the Drama Masjadi, and this is a maker's quarter that exploits industry. It has plus three industry per worker, and plus three industry by default, and plus three industry per adjacent maker's quarter. You also get plus two influence. The only thing you don't get here is the one extra worker's slot, but I believe the three industry bonus per workers actually makes up for most of the losses you get there. Of course, you would prefer to also get plus one worker slot, but because you can get plus three industry per worker per emblematic district, so essentially per territory inside a city, it can grow to a very high number if you start combining cities or territories together to basically supercharge your workforce. It's actually quite a insanely powerful building, but it is a bit unfortunate that you don't get an extra worker slot here for this emblematic district, as that would have eased the population issue that you would need to overcome. And of course, if it provides a worker by itself, you automatically get a lot of extra industries based on how many territories you have. Because if you think about it, let's say our city has four territories. If we had plus one worker per emblematic district, we would have gotten four workers and each of those workers will be producing additional 12 points of industry because of the four copies of the emblematic that we have. But because we don't have that, you're only boosting existing workers while pressuring your food supplies as your city continues to grow without providing more jobs by building four copies of your emblematic building. So it is kind of a drawback here, but overall still a very strong building. Then we have the Shuan for the Joseon, and this is a research quarter that exploits science. It provides plus two influence, plus two science, plus three science per adjacent research quarter, and plus one science per researcher on city or outpost, as well as plus one researcher slot. So pretty similar to the industry building we just covered because it is also an improvement on existing workforce, which is researchers in this case. But in addition to that, you also get plus one worker. Of course, it's only plus one science per researcher, but because these can stack, even this plus one is a very lovely bonus, and I still think it's a quite powerful building, even if it's not plus three. All the other bonuses are great as well. You also get a bit of influence here, but most importantly, that job actually has a lot of value. Then we have the Sultan Kami for the Ottomans. This is once again a faith building that exploits nothing. You gain one plus faith per district, plus three influence by default, and also plus three additional influence per adjacent district and minus 10 stability. This is very similar to the Ming Grand Tea House, except in this case, you're focused on faith per district instead of influence per district, but you still get quite a bit of influence just by building this district down. And once again, it's probably pretty well suited to be connected to garrison in my opinion. Any other sort of FIM related basic quarters will lose out on adjacency bonuses if you attach this to it just for the three points of influence because you have to think about the opportunity costs that you have to give up when you place one of these faith exploit nothing districts next to an existing FIM producing district that would benefit from any adjacency bonuses you would have otherwise had you simply build another copy of the basic quarter next to them. Then we have the Terra for the Edo Japanese, and this is again one of those districts that counts as nothing and exploits nothing. This one in particular is focused on influence, and you gain plus three faith by default, plus two influence by default, and most importantly, plus five influence per adjacent mountain. This bonus is quite similar to the Confucian school we saw in the ancient era for the Zhou. And in a very similar fashion, the weakness is pretty much the same. Because you're putting a district that does not exploit industries next to mountains, you lose out on all the industries on mountains, as well as the infrastructure boost you can give to those yields on the mountains as well. So there is a pretty big opportunity cost to build the Terra. You also don't really want any adjacent district to the Terra, as the Terra will provide no adjacency bonuses for whatever quarter you place there, and the Terra itself will also gain nothing because it doesn't gain from adjacency to another district like most of the other faith or influence building we saw so far, but rather just mountains. And you can't simply just build this anywhere, it has to be adjacent to a district, which makes it really awkward 
and pretty hard to use. And I don't think it's the best way to gain influence in the air. Even you have nothing but mountains in your land. I still think if the goal here is to gain lots of influences, you should have gone with the Ming here, which can gain a lot more influences when you don't even have to worry about what's on the map. Then moving on, we have the Three Sisters Plantation for the Haudenosaunee. And this is a farmer's quarter that exploit food. In my opinion, it's probably one of the best farmer's quarters in the game because you gain a whopping five food per number of attached territory. This scales extremely well, as we have seen before with many versions of plus three per number attached territories for a variety of resources. In this case, food, and you have five points here. It's very, very strong. In addition to that, you get plus three food per adjacent farmer's quarter. And most importantly, plus one farmer's slot. This is key. We knocked the Nimaton down a peg when it had the plus three per number of attached territories, simply because the Nimaton did not have this farmer slot because it's counterintuitive. You're trying to boost food production, so you'll grow your population. But if you don't provide job at the same time, you go into overpopulation and you end up consuming a lot more food than you bring in. So this building is perfect here. You have the farmer's quarter with the adjacency bonuses, you have the default attack territory bonuses, you exploit food, you get a job, you do lose 10 stabilities, but that's pretty standard for all emblematic districts. Then finally, we have the VOC warehouse for the Dutch, and this is the building that pays you off for picking harbor districts from before, because the adjacency you get here on this market quarter that exploit money is plus 20 money per adjacent harbor. There is a plus one money default, as well as plus two money per traders on City and Outpost, which is already very strong, and also plus one trader slot, which is what we love to see. So essentially, if you remember from all previous three eras, there's usually a unique emblematic district harbor building, the Nost, for example, from the medieval era. And now if you build this VOC warehouse, which is a land-based emblematic district adjacent to these harbors, you will gain plus 20 money per adjacent harbor. So you want to pick up as many of those unique ones and place them on a coastline in a way that you can fit the warehouse to touch multiple harbor buildings. So this can be your default harbor or your emblematic harbor. Of course, most of those harbors count for many other types of quarters. So putting them together already give you a lot of benefits. And then this one simply pays you off. Now the expected payment here, I would say should be around 40 to 60 money per VOC warehouse, in my opinion, simply because it's not reasonable to expect more than three adjacent harbors. That's considering you can fit your harbors around the edge of boundaries between territories and you can squeeze a couple VOC warehouse together around that area for just the default market quarter bonus next to a harbor. Essentially, if you think about the map, if you have an extreme peninsula, you could potentially fit five harbors and then put a VOC warehouse down. Or if you have a very tiny island, that's just one land uh, mass. And all you did in that region is to claim six harbors and put this down for 120 money. I don't even think that's worth it if you think about it. And also your harbors can provide adjacencies. So if you have an inlet bay that's sort of triangle shape you might put your harbor buildings so that they touch each other for adjacency bonuses. And in that case, the VOC warehouse can really only get two adjacencies from adjacent harbor. So you're giving up some on either side. Either the harbors don't touch as much as they could, or the VOC warehouse doesn't touch as much as they could. And depending on what you're missing, right? If you want a lot of money, this is the way to go. But honestly, I don't think you need to get that many adjacent harbor to make this building worth it the plus two money per traders is actually a very high value here and something very similar to the plus one science per researchers we saw on the Shuan, as well as the plus three industry per workers on the Jama Masayed that we saw earlier for the Mukas. So that's going to do it for our overview of all the emblematic district in the early modern era. Let's hop back over to the tier list and rank these. So like most of our tier lists, we're going to start from the bottom and there's actually a lot of really bad emblematic district in this era starting with the Bottega di RST. And this is the Venetian building that is a market quarter that exploits nothing, which doesn't make it weak. It provides a bit of influence and the adjacency bonus for additional market quarter is on influence. It does add one money to all tiles producing money, 
So essentially, if you have a lot of luxuries in your land, then this can become quite powerful as each of those luxuries will produce X amount of more gold where X is equal to how many territories you have in this city. That can add up quite a bit, but I don't think this is the best way to make money in my opinion. For example, the VOC warehouse, even if you get almost no harbor adjacencies, it's still better than this because of the added two money per trader per copy of that building. I believe in almost all games, even if you play on abundant luxuries, you're gonna end up with more traders than luxuries in every city. And you get plus two money per trader per copy of Invermatic on the VOC compared to this Bottega de Artis building. So I'm actually gonna drop this all the way to D tier. And you have to consider the fact that this building doesn't give you a trader slot, which I think is a big weakness for any Invermatic district. Then joining them in the D tier, we have the Cathedral Gothic, or the Gothic Cathedral for the Spanish. It is entirely a faith-producing emblematic district. You almost don't want to build that many of this once you become the Spanish. I had personally experienced a game where I played as the Spanish for the Conquistadors, and I looked at this building and I just didn't know where to put them down or why I should put down extra copies. I am paying industry costs to build this emblematic district that kills off all adjacency bonuses from my existing district. It actually strips away exploitation that I otherwise would had because it exploits nothing. So attaching this to any land I own will take away at least three exploitations while limiting three more exploitations on the land that it pushes out towards. And the only thing I gain back is extra faith. And if I already have all my tenants, it's completely useless. And if I don't have all my tenants and I'm super behind on science, this isn't going to change a thing. So in essence, I think this building could use a bit of help in terms of design. And I think it's one of the weakest buildings in the game because it simply doesn't have a role for your gameplay. Then joining the list here, we're going to also put in the Terra uh, for the Edo Japanese. And as a reminder, this one provides mainly influence. It also provides a little bit of faith but the bonus with mountains make this quite awkward. You do get a decent amount of influence, but very much like the Bottega di Artiste, there is a better influence producer in their own era, which makes them incredibly weak in comparison. And the adjacency to mountains provides the opportunity cost of lost industry that you otherwise could have gained just by building a maker's quarter attached to mountain tiles. And in addition to that, it also kills off any adjacency and also kills off all sorts of exploitation that you could have otherwise had with any other basic quarters. So this is also going to end up on our D tier. And if you thought that was it, we're not done. We're going to add the Sultan Kami also to the list. This is once again another faith building, exploits nothing, all sorts of similar issues with most of these buildings here. Plus one faith per district is helpful, but Faith is not the strongest thing in the game, and I don't think you need that much of it. This at least adds a little bit of extra influence for you for adjacent district. So in essence, you could build this next to, say, garrison districts to get the bonus influence and also get plus one faith on those existing districts in a very similar fashion that you might use the Grand Tea House. But I think the Grand Tea House does the job better. So if your goal was to actually gain influence by having these adjacencies, you will go with the Grand Tea House. The plus one extra faith on all your district in the city, including those garrisons, seems powerful, but faith is a lot less useful than influence in the game. So this is gonna be our D tier emblematic district. Moving on to the C, I can put the Barbican in here. It has a very defined role of being an improved garrison in every aspect, free influence, extra defense, more combat strength, as well as extra stability. So I can't complain about it. Whether it's useful or not for your gameplay, that's a different question. If you have a place where you can build a garrison, this emblematic is a much superior choice and it scales well with the additional combat strength booth that you can use at any era. So I feel like it's at least deserving of a C rank, but it's also gonna be the only emblematic district in this rank as we move on to the B. And we're gonna put the Grand Tea House here. 
So it's not the strongest district in the world, but it does have a role. It is incredibly useful for gaining influence. As we mentioned before for the Sultan Kami building, the ideal build is surrounded with garrison. You don't lose anything, and the building itself provides 10 points of stability. That's an added bonus that the Sultan Kami does not have, which actually loses 10 points stability. And you give every single district you own extra influence, and you also gain adjacency influence. So it's a pure influence play, which is exactly what you want. So it's going to sit here in the B tier. Then moving on to the A tier, we have quite a few choices, starting off with the VOC warehouse. So this is our payoff building for all the harbor choices you went through for the earlier three eras. But like I mentioned before, this building by itself is incredibly powerful just because it can provide two money per trader slot and also gives you a trader slot. So it's kind of the ideal play here. And the bonus with adjacent harbor is just sort of the cherry on top, making it quite a powerful district for you to use in this era. Then joining it, we also have the Jama Masajid. It's very similar in that it provides additional yield for the workers in this case, three points of industry. It's very high. It's actually stronger than the plus two money. It's also stronger than the plus one research that we're gonna see from the Shuan very soon. But the weakness of this district that is not putting it into the S tier is it doesn't give you a worker slot. And it might seem very little on paper, but I think it's actually worth quite a bit because you're building multiple copies of this building. So you're losing out on multiple workers. Essentially, it's a design flaw and I hope something that the developers can fix because I don't think any building should be precluded from providing an extra job of that type. That just seems wrong because if you want to say that's too strong and not balanced, then you have buildings that giving the exact same bonuses for a different type of FIM that have the job. So it's kind of confusing in my mind. I feel like they need to be more consistent here and I'm going to put this at a very strong A, not quite S, but it's great. I don't think you can go wrong with any of these picks here. And the three industry points, very, very strong. Then joining them, as we mentioned before, is the Shuan. This is only plus one research per researcher, but it's still very, very good with this type of bonus. All three of these buildings here have this exact same type of job-related additional boost, and I think it scales incredibly well, especially with the multi-city build that is very popular right now. As many cities as you can, because you can scale up the population, you can scale up the infrastructure. Essentially, every city will have a copy of the infrastructure. And many of the infrastructure buildings actually provide a lot of extra researchers. If you look up all the infrastructure related science, I think it provides the most jobs out of all the other FIMS. So it actually scales incredibly well with the Shuan here. Then finally, in the S tier, it has to be the Three Sisters Plantation. It is just incredibly powerful with the attached territories. In my opinion, that type of bonus scales the best into the late game because you will most likely be able to absorb a few cities together and that bonus can become outrageous, even better than population bonus in my mind. Because at the end of the day, it's very hard to sustain a very high population in the game of humankind, but combining multiple territories into one mega city it's actually a lot more doable. And when you have a mega city, it doesn't mean you have a huge population. Population actually scales best when you have smaller cities as you can only grow up to one population per turn, assuming you're not moving populations around. But in essence, that kind of limitation maximizes your population growth when you have multiple small cities. And then you can try to combine them in the late game to try to get a bigger population city. But even then, it's hard to feed them. But the problem with multiple small city play is many of the buildings we see in the A tier are scaled off of those population. So if the city is already small, that means you don't have that many territories in those cities. Therefore, you can't get that many copies of the emblematic district. So in essence, that bonus scale off of multiple factors. You have to have a lot of population, but you can't have that many territories, so you can't have that many copy of your emblematic, so you can't boost each of those workers as much as you want. Whereas for something like attached territories, 
it's not dependent on population at all. You can have a zero population city, but you could have seven or eight attached uh, sections to it in terms of territory, and you can get 300 plus food with this building. Because if you think about it, plus five food per territory, let's say you have eight territories in the city, that's 40 food per territory because each territory can build their copy of three sisters, that's going to be 320 food for you without doing anything. You can have no population and that bonus is still yours. Whereas for the three buildings in A, that's not the case. And also if you go to war, if you lose population, you've had to build units, you will lose out on that bonus as you proceed with those war. Whereas the three sister or any sort of territory bonus or any sort of tile bonus, anything you add to tiles are irrelevant with population and that stays with your building no matter how much your population fluctuates. So that's my tier list here. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. If you have any opinions in terms of how you use these district to make them better or worse, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and I'll definitely reassess how to use these. And we'll come back next week to finish up with our last two eras. Hopefully you guys enjoy these and I'll see you all next time. Bye.